let's get started. Um, who can tell me? Okay, shh. If your packet's not out, then you are already behind. And I'm moving on. Can anybody t remind me what the graph of natural log looks like? Never took yes. zero. Okay, y'all are, y'all are, it's hard to see what y'all mean, but watch what I'm going to do. It looks like this. Oh, yeah. Because it's an L. All right, so I want to remind you of something. I'll, I'll come back to this. Just give me a second here. Remember this from day one? This was the graph of e to the x. If you flipped this over the y equals x line, it would look like natural log. These two things are inverses. E to the x and natural log of x are inverses. Okay, now based off the graph, what can you say the domain of natural log x is? Zero to infinity. See how there's an asymptote at x equals zero? And so um, what, this, what I really want to point out here is you can only take natural log of positive numbers. Do y'all remember something about positive numbers we already discussed? Um, e to anything, the result will always be positive. Now, the input has to be positive, okay? What do you think about the output, the range? Negative infinity to infinity. So in other words, the domain and range is flip-flopped from e to the x and natural log x. And you actually have already learned this before, but I wanted to remind you <clears throat> for a couple of reasons. The fact that we can only take natural log of positive numbers can affect when we start doing things with natural log. And remember, natural log is just log base e. All right, this function is continuous. Good thing, now we can do all the stuff we know we can do. What does increasing tell us about f prime? It's positive. positive. We talked a little bit about one-to-one -one before. It's not really going to affect much of what we do. Um, there are certain theorems that only work on one-to-one -one functions, but we don't really discuss those. But what one-to-one -one means is that every x only has one y. That's definition of a function. It works the other way as well. Any given y value only has a single x partner, okay? <clears throat> and so it's not a big deal if you remember that or learn that right now. It's not going to affect what we're doing right now. Okay, looking at this graph, it doesn't look, su th there's a bend to it. Can you see which way it's bent? Down. What does that tell us about the second derivative? It's negative. Negative. Okay. All right, over here we have some log properties. And the whole reason we need to review these is so that we can use them to make certain problems easier. All right, certain problems could be really difficult, but if you apply a log property, it gets so much easier. So if you know it, shout it out. Anybody know what natural log of E is? One. One. Okay, what about natural log of one? Hint, it is not E. Zero. Okay, does anybody remember how to expand a log? Log A, log a plus a ln of b. b. Log A plus log B. And if you're like, why are we not multiplying? Why are we adding? It's for the same reason that when you are multiplying exponents, like x squared times x cubed, you add those exponents. It's for that same reason. Okay, what about if what you're taking log of, which we usually call the log argument, if it has a power, what can you do with that power? Bring it to the front. I'm not talking about deriving right here. This is a log property. And if you can not have an exponent, then that's what you want to do. It will make the problem easier. All right. <clears throat> Five, very similar to three. Log A minus log B. Good. And then this six property kind of combines one and four together. So the N would come down and be in front, and we'd be left with the natural log of E, which is one. So that simplifies to just N. So natural log of e squared is just 2. That could help if we needed to simplify. All right. 
so that was just kind of a quick review of some log stuff. We'll, we'll use most of that in today's lesson, maybe even all of it. All right, this next part is probably not the best thing to explain Friday before a long weekend. So I'm going to kind of give you the shortened version of this because I'm going to go into this more next week. So if you are integrating a polynomial, we know that we add one to the polynomial, right? That does not work with something like this. Okay, think about what this, if we rewrote it. If I added one, we would get zero, which means there'd be no x. And that's not the way this works. If you're ever like, what is ln again? Here's the deal. ln is the inverse of e. That's what it is. Okay, here's a more formal definition that you do not need to know. What we're going to, though, do is use this to find derivative of natural log of x. So if I derive a natural log, and over here I'm deriving an integral, do you remember how to derive an integral? It cancels, and so all we would need to do is plug in the upper bound times the derivative of the upper bound minus plug in the lower bound times the derivative of the lower bound. And what does all that simplify to? 1 over x. So if you're kind of like, ugh, I've zoned out, here's what you need to know. The derivative of natural log x is 1 over x. All right, I kind of explained why it works that way. You're not going to really be thinking of that when you're doing problems. You just need to know this. Those red cards I gave you last semester for to help you memorize derivative rules, this was one of them. Because we have learned this before. We, I've taught it at least, okay? It's just been a while. So if the natural log of x when you take derivative is 1 over x, what happens when you turn that into a u? 1 over u times the derivative of u, which we could write as du, or we could write it as u prime. I'm going to just go ahead and use u prime here. You Basically what happens is, so like on number 1, to find y prime, you go 1 over the log argument, and when I mean log argument, I mean the, what you're taking log of, that thing in parentheses. And then you go times the derivative of the log argument. This is an application of chain rule. Did we do this? Yes, we did this. And in fact, some of these examples, if you kept all your notes packaged from last semester, you, there's a lot of repeated examples because they're good ones. All right, so that's how you do that. You could go ahead and put the 2x on top, but you don't have to. It's fine the way it is right here. All right. <clears throat> okay, let's look at 2. I see an x times a natural log of x. So in general, what do we do when we derive something times something? Product rule. Okay. So let's do this one step at a time. Derivative of x, 1 times just the second thing. Don't do two derivatives back to back. Plus for product rule, x times, and then this is the new slash review thing today, 1 over x. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. That's something you kind of just need to know, kind of like your trig things that you do. All right, and that's your answer. This would be probably... Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but this would be totally something that could be multiple choice because it's actually very easy to simplify. Is that what you're going to ask? So if we simplified this, that second term becomes a 1. You don't have to be able to do this, but I want you to be able to at least, if there are multiple choice answers, pick out the one that's equivalent to your answer. Okay. Okay. What rule do we need on number three? A function to another function, a chain rule. Yep, an M&M. &M. This, though, is a regular M&M. &M. It's not a peanut M&M. &M. So you have an inner function of natural log x, the outer function of cubed. We deal with the outer function while leaving the inner function alone. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inner function. So what would I multiply by here? 1 over x. That's your answer.
Okay. Four. What do we normally do when we see a square root? Put it in parentheses and make it go to the one half power. So what we need to do here is we can actually use a log property. This number four is different than three. On three, the whole thing was being cubed. On four, only the log argument is being taken to the one half. So we can rewrite this as one half natural log x plus one. All right, I haven't derived yet. I've just rewritten using that log property. Sorry if I'm making any of you motion sick, but this log property right there, number four. Okay, so then y prime, do I need to use product rule? I have a one half times natural log of x plus one. Do we need product rule? Why not? It's not a function of x times a function of x. It's just a number times a function of x. If you, though, did do product rule, you should get the same answer. That's kind of overkill. It's not necessary. So we're just going to do one half times the derivative of natural log of x plus one. So this is kind of very similar to example one. One over the log argument times the derivative of the log argument. And there you go. Okay. I'm not going to go into too much detail today about this, but absolute value bars, what does that do to something? Makes it positive. Why would it be important to make something positive that you're taking natural log of? You can only take natural log of positive things. So you may be thinking, well, why wasn't this on every other problem that we did? All right, if that's how it's supposed to be written, you might not, you might not care at all. I get that. But if you look at number one really quick, could x squared plus three even be negative? No. no. So that's why this problem didn't have absolute value bars. Okay? And so there are other times. Sometimes you're going to see them and sometimes you aren't. And honestly, it is not going to affect your problem at all. Okay? <clears throat> now, when we integrate natural log, we're going to have to figure out when to use absolute value bars. That's for next week. We won't worry about that today. So... Ignoring the absolute value bars, I want you to try number five on your own. And I even want you to try to simplify five. It, it's going to be okay. Okay, 1 over cosine x times negative sine. negative sine x. That's perfect. It's beautiful. All right, anybody tell me what this simplifies to? Negative tan, negative tan x. So if this was multiple choice, probably that would happen. 1 over the argument times derivative of the argument. So it's not like Well, when we go times the derivative of the argument, that's like chain rule. It's like saying times the derivative of the inside. So you wouldn't do like n5g times g5. That actually is what we're doing. It doesn't seem that way. You're, most people, when they do these problems, they think of it more like a rule as opposed to chain rule. But it actually works whether you think of it either way. Like, because <coughs> this is function f natural log of another function cosine x. But anyway. Um, okay. Number six is super crazy. Mm -hmm. But can we rewrite number six so that it's maybe just smaller, less crazy pieces? So the first piece, I'll do that one. That one's easy. Natural log of x. Now, right here, there's a times. So we're going to write a plus. Now I'm going to break this down into two steps. Some of you might be thinking, you don't need to do that. You can skip this step, but 
I'm going to go ahead and do that. All right, and then since this thing down here is divided by, I'm going to go minus natural log of square root of 4x squared minus 4. Okay, I can actually write this even further. And keep in mind, I haven't even derived yet. All right, but this is going to make deriving way easier. What was that property, and I used it in number four, what can I do with this two? Move it to the front. That's not a deriving step. That's just a rewriting it so that what we have is a little bit easier to work with. So do you see another place that I could use that? Yeah, minus, and then do one half, natural log. Ooh, I'm running out of room here. You're, you're, you don't want to, the minus just comes from the bottom. The square root is what causes the one half, so it's just minus a half. Don't put two negatives in there. All right, so all of that was kind of prep work, but it makes the derivative part easier. So we first start here. What's the derivative of natural log x? 1 over x. All right, plus 2 times. What do we think? 1 over x Very good. Okay, minus a half times. That's what I was saying. Most of you are not consciously thinking, I'm doing chain rule. You're thinking, this is how we do natural log derivatives. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> if you want to simplify, go for it. I'm going to circle it and go on my way. All right, so that's just kind of a review, although it was a long time ago, of how to derive natural log. If you turn it over, we're not going to do all these problems today. We're just going to do just a few of them, okay? Um, and what we need is to just transfer our knowledge of what we already know about derivatives and then use natural log to answer these questions, all right? Um, you actually have all the knowledge you need right now to do any of the problems on this page. So if we're trying to do relative extrema, what is a good first step? Take the derivative. I'm going to simplify it just a first step, take the derivative. So go ahead and go for it. If you need a hint, look up at the board. Hold on, hold that thought. Okay, if someone just walked in here and they didn't know, like all they saw was what was written in red, would they know that I'm really multiplying by all of 2x plus 2? Oh, no. It kind of looks like I'm just multiplying by 2x, so how could we fix that? Parentheses. All right, now either way, we're, gonna, we're about to re-simplify this, so I want you to go ahead on this one and rewrite it so that we multiply the 1 times the 2x plus 2, and then down here we have this. <clears throat> so this is our derivative. You have possible relative extrema when your derivative is 0 or undefined. When we did this with e, we really didn't have to worry too much about undefined because you can take e to any number. With natural log, it creates fractions, and we might have some restrictions, okay? So it's not really that hard what we need to do. We just need to set the top equal to 0. That would mean the whole thing is 0. And if I set the bottom equal to 0, that takes care of the undefined piece. 
All right, and so we did this before and we even did natural logs. When you have a fraction for your y prime, you do both so that when you're trying to locate your critical numbers, you're doing possible relative maxes and mins that are smooth curves and also cusps. All right, which one is easier to solve? The first one. What is it? X equals negative 1. Okay, so I have a for sure critical number. All right. <clears throat> Does the denominator factor? Yes. Are you sure? It doesn't factor because, like, we should have some negatives in here or the 2 and 3 should be switched. It doesn't factor. So let me tell you, when you see this, as long as you did it correctly, it means that it's not going to give me any solutions down there. You do not have to write this on your notes, but I want to show you something up here. If I were to go ahead and apply quadratic formula to solve for x, again, you don't have to write this down. This is what I'm about to show you is going to be an expected result. Anybody singing the song in their head? Yeah. Okay. The pop goes the weasel. All right, so... <coughs> So if you look at this, what's happening to the thing underneath the square root? Yeah, so what is 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 3? Don't give me a number, give me a word. Negative. So this whole thing is imaginary. And let's just be super thankful that we don't deal with imaginaries in this calculus. Okay? So what that means is the denominator, that x squared thing, cannot be zero, which means it's always positive or always negative. You want to guess which one? Positive. positive. Look at all that plus stuff. So that thing is always going to be positive. That might be helpful in a minute. Okay? And it makes sense. I can only take natural log of positive things anyway. All right. So this is where we take, in this case, I only have one critical number and we plug it into the original or the derivative? So it, if, do I care if f is positive or negative or if f prime is positive or negative? f prime. So you can plug it into either version of the derivative. I kind of think this might be a little bit easier to see. Keep in mind that denominator always positive. So all you really got to worry about is this piece right there. If you take a number like negative 2 and you plug it in for x, you will get a negative result. Which, if f prime is negative, then f is decreasing. That's why we do this. What happens if I take a number greater than negative 1? Plus. Increasing. So the question didn't really ask specifically about increasing and decreasing. It asked about relative extrema. So I can see here that I have a relative min happening at x equals negative 1 because f prime, we probably should technically say y prime, um, but it's okay um, either way, is, changes, is changing or changes negative to positive. <clears throat> if you needed to do um, points of inflection or whatever, we'd have to do the second derivative. Okay, which we've done before. So that's that transference thing of knowledge that I was talking about. You, even if you've never done a specific problem, you've done problems like it. And so you can apply different concepts into a new problem. All right, let's do number eight. Okay. So implicit differentiation. We've been, we already practiced this. What makes this equation implicit? X's and Y's are on the same side. Now, this specific thing, I could probably get Y by itself. This one wouldn't be too hard to do. But it specifically says use implicit, so I don't really have a choice. So I take derivative with respect to X of both sides. And I'm going to start my work over here. And this one actually is a lot easier than most of the other ones that we've done. Um, derivative of X to the fifth. That's just simple power rule. We don't, it's an X term, so I don't need anything after that. This next part is the new thing. How do you take derivative of natural log of X again? 
1 over x. All right, plus derivative of y cubed, 3y squared, times dy over dx. You do that because we took derivative of a y term. And then for whatever reason, this is really where most people make their mistake. Derivative of 2 is 0. Don't keep that as 2. Remember, we're deriving both sides. All right, there's only a single dy over dx term, so this one's actually pretty easy to isolate. Go ahead and do this part on your own. Okay, I want you to look at what I'm writing and look at what you're writing. It may not be in the exact same order, but see if it's the same, equivalent. to simplify though we would have a problem because we'd still have a fraction within a fraction so we'd have to do something else next which we're not going to talk about today but um yeah all right so if you look at the rest of these notes we're not going to do any of these but i want you to think about them do you know how to write tangent lines yes. no. yeah <laughs> y'all are crazy over there <laughs> we know how to write tangent lines and we need a point and a slope. And now we know how to take derivative of y. Does 10 look weird? Sure it does. We'll worry about that one next week. Look at 11. Could you do 11? Yes. Increasing, decreasing, and relative extrema. That's very similar to the one we did up at the top. Have we practiced concavity today? No, but you have knowledge of how to do that. I'm not saying you should. I'm going to give you a quiz over this, but... It shouldn't be like you have no idea how to do this, okay? All right, here is the homework assignment, and this is going to be due Wednesday. So keep in mind that the homework that you had already, I already checked the first assignment. The second assignment, the other half of 357, that's due Tuesday, all right? And then this is due Wednesday. Each homework assignment, you're going to get two days to do. I'm not looking for 100% completion. I'm looking for, did you try it, and do you know what kind of questions you have? Generate questions when you're working on the assignments.